Good afternoon, uh, audience. Uh, my name is James Black. I'm the Chief of Vascular Surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital. In my experience here at Johns Hopkins Hospital, we have a very big uh, genetic disorders clinic related to cardiovascular disease, and obviously patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome fall well within that uh, arena. Uh, today, the charge of my lecture is to talk about the surgical and endovascular management of patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and what are the implications for the emergency room? That is, when in the emergency room, what are the things that you have to bring to the table so that the practitioners understand uh, what it is you're feeling and what are the possibilities that uh, they may have to confront? We are all aware of stories where perhaps the patient's advocate was oftentimes usually themselves, that maybe even the emergency department physician hadn't even heard of Ehlers-Danlos or maybe would have even less knowledge of the individual subtypes. So what we're gonna go through today will give us some base of information to understand not only the vascular complications, but how those vascular complications are shared across several of the EDS subtypes. So we'll start with the first slide here. And just a general overview, uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a, a hereditary connective tissue disorders. And these are mutations in the genes that regulate our collagen matrix. And there are six different Ehlers-Danlos subtypes. Um, there are many more, but these are the six most common, classical, hypermobile, vascular, kyphoscoliotic, anticlassic, and dermatosporotic. Now, importantly, the most common type that have vascular complications are classical, hypermobile, and both the vascular EDS. And these, all these disorders are characterized by some degree of joint hypermobility, skin extensibility, and tissue fragility. And it's, of course, specific to the vascular arena, vascular EDS would be the one that would be most scary from the standpoint of vascular fragility, vascular ruptures, arterial dissections, but we see vascular issues in these other types and the patients as well as their practitioners will have to be aware of that. Unfortunately, because the vascular complications in EDS are, are very severe in vascular EDS, sometimes what happens is the other non-vascular EDS subtypes don't have the same degree of reporting. And in fact, some of them might have even have arterial problems. It could be more venous problems than arterial. So this experience of difficulty in surgically or uh, managing someone with vascular EDS gets sort of spilled over into the non-vascular EDS subtypes. And of course, then that leads to concerns about moving ahead with any treatment. And so when you're in a pinch in the emergency room, and, and you have hypermobile EDS and someone says, oh my God, Ehlers-Danlos, we shouldn't do anything to this patient for fear that their tissues are too weak. Some of those arguments don't apply. Um, however, with vascular EDS, it is a much different uh, equation. And I think that the, the, because of that and because the scary things about vascular EDS and the difficulties and the complications and the risks that someone could pass away gets proselytized across the EDS subtypes then we have patients who are unfairly being um, denied or even uh, deferred on having procedures that could potentially benefit them. However, truthfully, things have really changed quite a bit for all patients with EDS. We didn't really have the same armamentarium for endovascular procedures, catheter-based procedures that we had even 10 or 20 years ago. So for example, here, a, a contained rupture of a carotid artery on a woman soon after delivering a child. Um, this would have been a terrible, terrible open surgery to tackle um, in the traditional surgical incisions. Um, however, here with stents and wires, we can sometimes treat these areas of aneurysms in a very non-invasive way that doesn't have the same risk profile. And, and particularly when a patient with EDS comes to the emergency room and there's a discussion about the benefits or risks of proceeding with a traditional surgical procedure, there has to be significant input from the patient to understand that their disease may have tissue fragility or may not have tissue fragility. And advocating for oneself to have the practitioners understand that, or perhaps even insisting the emergency department physicians talk to their treating physicians at home who might know them better is clearly good medicine. If you're wondering about the coils appreciated um, on this particular um, image right here that are filling this aneurysm, um, it's quite a number of coils. You could actually add that up to about 100 yards of coils to then produce the occlusion of that, that aneurysm. That aneurysm then shrunk down and now, whereas previously a tennis ball size is now about a golf ball size. So it's a dramatic improvement for the patient. 
Um, similarly here, you know, another very difficult problem of someone with vascular DS who actually ruptured their iliac artery, seen here, draping into the pelvis, into the iliac vein, draining back towards the heart. This is a very, very difficult situation to fix with open surgery, and we all know that the arteries can be fragile in EDS, particularly vascular EDS, but the veins can be even more troublesome. And so I was pleased to be able to address this with, a, again, a catheter-based approach. So here the patient is lying on their stomach, and we we're able to enter through the buttock, pick up that artery, and then put a plug, the plug being this device right here. And that plug then is going to block the connection between the uh, artery and the vein. And we were able to get the patient out of this uh, very difficult situation smoothly. Um, this is a paper that us at Hopkins, and it, it's a little dated, our number is a little higher now, but you can see for vascular issues that have come up for patients with EDS, we see a number of patients with classical and hypermobile and vascular subtypes who come into this, uh, into this concern. And so um, most of these patients um, that we see are a great majority of them, 82% in this case was was uh, female sex. And this is an important thing to note is that as patients with EDS get older, sometimes it is that the males are symptomatic first. And so uh, particularly um, for vascular EDS, um, you know, males as they're hitting the growth spurt, uh, putting on a lot of muscle, engaging in sports, that's a time where uh, people have to pay close attention to sort of what their output is, what their exercise tolerance is, what the recommendation from the physicians is about exercise and sort of work to that um, work within those boundaries. Um, we had very good luck with our endovascular procedures, and I would clearly believe that for most patients with EDS, this is the way to go, you know, a catheter-based procedure versus a traditional type of operation. So you can see a number of procedures here, many of which are called embolization. So in the situation of an artery that has an abnormal connection, you can embolize it to interrupt that abnormal connection. In a situation where an artery might be bleeding, um, you can sometimes put coils or plugs, like I showed you earlier, into that artery to stop bleeding. So uh, many of these cases are embolizations, and that's a really good way to handle concerns of bleeding or risk of bleeding. Um, in many of these cases, we can do without general anesthesia, which is great for terms uh, in terms of recovery. Um, the you know open procedures are definitely a, a more difficult uh, thing. You can see here. Um, let me try and get that to pop back up. There you go. Um, you can see here, we did have some patients pass away who had uh, um, more you know, significant vascular operations, particularly in the vascular EDS group. And that's an area that we continue to struggle with and find the balance. And obviously patients can be their best advocate, particularly in an emergency setting to understand what the balance is for those procedures. And frankly, if those um, concerns are not being met in the emergency room, that's the point where you have to you know, ask for the transfer to a place that'd be more familiar with your condition, particularly if it's in a, you're in a community setting and, and far from the surgical support that you would need or blood bank support or anesthesia support that would be part of this equation also. I'm often asked, particularly when a issue of aortic dissection comes up. So we know that patients with Ehlers-Danlos um, have a risk for arterial dissection, not just arterial rupture, but also arterial dissection, which is where the layers of the artery start to separate and come apart. Um, for patients without a genetically based component to their, their disorder, um, uh, we generally like to use stents and sometimes that's a good, good test or a good way to go. But in fact, connective tissue disorders were actually an exclusion criteria for all of the devices that are currently available to us on the market for vascular and cardiovascular surgery. And the concern was well, if the arteries are a little fragile and the device has radial force or the device has a tendency to straighten and the device has a bare metal stent, you know, what would be the implications for that against an artery that might not be totally biologically normal? So the companies completely, you know, divorce themselves of any consideration for patients with connective tissue disorder. Similarly, again, about the fragility of the aortic wall, um, for placing these stents in the aorta, they are worried about the stent causing trauma, they're worried about new dissections being induced by the trauma of that stent. And then of course, the failure to even control the dissection at all. And this is a picture on the bottom here that shows a bare metal stent that's completely sticking out of the aorta. It's not inside the blood vessel anymore. The stent is, but the bare metal portion of the stent, which just looks like a paper clip of metal running across the top of the stent like a picket fence, is completely outside the aorta. Similarly here, 
this upper picture, you can see the stench has pushed out the top of the aorta. So these are real significant concerns, rightfully so, about these devices. And we have to be very um, uh, circumspect and a little cautious to, to jump right into an immediate treatment plan that would include stent grafting um, if you're showing up in the emergency room with a concern of an aortic dissection. Um, here at Hopkins, we've, we've taken a particular uh, interest, as I said, in patients with genetically based vascular disorders. And, and I've taken a position that most of these are best done in an operating room. And so, you know, when patients have vascular issues, and those issues can be major and life-threatening, as we've been discussing, and they can also be more minor. For example, varicose veins. We know varicose veins are very common in vascular DS, and they're common in some of the other EDS subtypes too. Probably not the sort of situation where we want to have those done in a, you know, an office in a strip mall, um, you know, uh, uh, where maybe you don't have the same support as you would in the hospital. So, you know, our patients who have EDS, we do these procedures in an operating room. We have a very good uh, cardiovascular anesthesia team that tries to, you know, keep the blood pressure st strictly controlled. Obviously, the vessels um, in any form of the operation are going to have some stress, and so we try to reduce the uh, blood pressure to reduce the, the risk that these catheters we put inside the artery could whip around and induce their own uh, trauma. Most of our patients um, uh, with EDS are very young, so they tolerate having their blood pressure induced to be low. Obviously, the lower blood pressure is less stress on the vessels, less risk for bleeding, and so we've had really good luck with that, and um, it's been a sort of pillar of our management. Um, for patients with vascular EDS, there are definitely vessels that we worry about. The celiac artery, the external iliac artery, these tend to have some element of baseline arterial dissection or, or at least some baseline of dilation. So we worry that the vessel is inherently fragile and we're super careful to work across those areas. Um, ultimately, if you talk about patients with EDS and not just vascular EDS, I think the key the key thing here is having a, a real multidisciplinary evaluation to access to really consider the risk of elective surgery. You have to balance the risk of the tissue fragility versus the surgery itself. The invasive procedures, I think, should really be performed in a hospital setting, not an office or a surgery center where your vascular surgery capabilities may not be as optimal. Uh, embolization techniques are really a great solution um, over stent graft therapy. Um, uh, or open surgery when anatomically feasible. So that means there are some situations where you just can't embolize the vessel. For example, the carotid artery I showed you earlier where you can't embolize that vessel and take out its circulation entirely because then the right brain would not have the circulation it needs and the result would be a stroke. So there are situations that we, we have to do something other than embolization, but embolization is clearly the, the first and uh, easiest and best step um, when encountering life-threatening bleeding. Um, stent graft therapy I discussed is, is really used preferentially only when there's vascular rupture um, or you have an arterial dissection that's directly threatening um, uh, someone's well-being. And so we try to limit our exposure of EDS patients to stent graft therapy, knowing that those just really aren't well-tested in that patient group in the, in the pivotal studies that led to their approval by the FDA. Um, Open surgery for vascular EDS, um, you know, probably should only be considered from experienced centers, um, younger patients, uh, favorable surgical history, that is, they, they did well with other operations. And I mentioned here this unique type of mutation in the collagen 3A1, um, and this is called haploinsufficiency. So a small percentage of people with vascular EDS will have a particular type of mutation that clearly is more favorable for surgical handling. And so that's a a key question that I ask patients when I'm seeing them for the first time, what type of mutation do they have? Um, what is their experience with surgery in the past? Did they do okay with it? How did things heal up? Um, and that uh, is a real um, uh, significant consideration. Um, many patients with EDS will have uh, a need for hernia repair. Um, and most of these direct hernia repairs, if they're not supplanted or reinforced with other uh, adjuncts, will go on to fail. So. Um, other than directly closing the hernia, usually mesh or other prosthetics will have to be uh, put on there. Uh, colon rupture is also something we worry about in the general surgical field with uh, vascular ES, and that really should be treated with a resection of the 
um, infected colon and an, at least initially a colostomy. Um, trying to remove the piece of colon and then stick it back together um, usually fails because the body is under such stress from that situation that the healing potential of the uh, two ends of the colon just aren't optimal and, and having a leak between that uh, intestinal connection can be life-threatening. Um, lastly, I put here, and this is a question um, uh, that comes up when people have had um, a tremendous involvement of their colon from diverticula, which we, can, we know is part of the EDS uh, picture, um, you can consider just removing the colon entirely. Um, however, again, that's a, a balance of risk and what uh, a person's individual surgical history is. So this is sort of just the, 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 the crosswalk of, of what we, we try and work with here at Johns Hopkins Hospital to manage our patients with EDS. Um, you know, the point of our lecture today was talking about emergency departments, and I know I, I digress from that quite a bit to talk about specific surgical therapy. Uh, but um, on almost any occasion, um, uh, a patient with EDS and particularly vascular EDS is going to have to advocate to understand um, the playbook for uh, their condition to some degree, not be expert, but at least understand the balance of these various choices. And so by knowing some of this information and knowing what the results can be, hopefully you'd have a situation where you'd be more empowered um, to understand the emergency room, help your practitioners in the emergency department help your situation um, in the best way possible to get you back into good health. So thank you very much, and I hope you're having a great conference.